Welcome to the first episode of The Key's brand new podcast, Trust Matters Lessons in Leadership with me, Ellie Potter. In this series, I'll be speaking to multi-academy trust leaders, sector experts, leadership coaches, and more to hear about their journeys in leadership. You'll gain practical tips and advice and get their insights on some of the biggest topics impacting the education sector right now. In this week's episode, we welcome Chris Goodall, Head of Digital Education at Bourne Education Trust. I'll be asking Chris how he has rolled out the use of AI across the trust, whether he believes AI is a threat to the teacher profession, and why he decided to embark on a trip to base camp at Mount Everest. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to leave us a review or like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome, Chris. If you wouldn't mind, could we just start at the very start? Mm -hmm. So where your journey in education began up until now? Yeah, so I've been in teaching about 25 years now. I think this is actually my 25th year in education. I was in a secondary school for about 11 years. Mm -hmm. Um, I then left to become an education consultant and supported IT teams within schools. Um, I then worked for a local authority and I uh, created an online school, which is, st- is still going now. And then I had a stint back in education, so for about six years in a school. And now this year, or the year just gone, I'm head of digital education for the Bourne Trust. He just touched on the online school. That's a really interesting concept. How does that work? Yeah, so it's uh, essentially been set up to cope with uh, those children who are in alternative provision. Okay. Um, so initially in the local authority, they had a load of uh, uh, teachers uh, who would go into students' homes mm-hmm. who, were, uh, who were out of education and support them. And obviously that's quite a, uh, an inefficient and quite a costly method of, of educating students in, in those sorts of settings. So um, we set up an online school which catered for those students, which was more of a drop in, drop into individual lessons um, to... Not, not as a replacement for face-to-face yeah. teaching, but uh, to also uh, provide a, an alternative form of provision. Okay. And what made you want to do the switch from classroom teaching? Like, was there a moment when you thought, I'm ready to take the next level outside of the classroom, or was it just a natural progression? I mean, I still love teaching. I yeah. love being in the classroom. It's it's something I just enjoy doing. So nothing, I, I, I've never been the ambitious type who said, I want to do this, this, mm-hmm. and this, and gun for it, really. It's just a natural progression. I've always been into technology, always enjoyed technology. And even, even when I first started teaching, I remember we used overhead projectors and were writing on acetates. And I, I, in the first year of teaching, I was up in front training staff to use PowerPoint to print out on acetates. Ridiculous now. But <laughs> yeah, looking back print, now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, using technology yeah. to help make things quicker or better. And that's, that's for me, that's what technology can do. It, it just can help make things more efficient or, or improve mm-hmm. the way we're doing things in school. And going from printing out PowerPoints to becoming <laughs> head of digital education is quite a gap, especially now in the world of AI. And what are your primary goals and responsibilities as head of digital education? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's a fairly new role, but I, I guess really it's, it, it's about enabling the whole trust and all the schools within the trust to take advantage of what a technology can bring. And, and as I said before, it's about efficiency. It's about doing things either quicker or better or, or, or more engaging. And so really I work closely, less on the technical side actually, we've got an IT director in the trust, but I work very closely with them. Um, but I position myself really as a bridge between the technology and the business side, the, the education and the classroom. And it's really, we've broken down sort of a, a strategy into eight, eight key areas, but it's making sure that you know the infrastructure's right, the hardware devices are there, that there's well-chosen, purposeful software as opposed to just bringing in shiny tools into the classroom. And then really the people side of it, making sure the people uh, feel confident and are equipped to, to work with that technology to do the things that they want to do in the classroom. And when you say you had those eight points in your strategy, how did you get to those eight points and how do they actually look in practice down at school level? So really, I, I guess it's about looking at what the barriers are for people in adopting technology. And and again, I've always believed that you shouldn't adopt technology just for the sake of Mm -hmm. adopting technology. So it's always with a purpose and and to solve an existing problem in school. So really, it's it's looking at what were the barriers to to people adopting that technology. So the first one really is infrastructure. You know, if if your Wi-Fi isn't right, if you you haven't got the devices in, in the school, then very quickly... But, you know, people who are not confident with technology, if they come across a, a problem, 
they will revert very quickly back to the traditional ways of working, which isn't necessarily a problem. But if you're trying to to enable them to do things better with technology, you want to re remove those problems. So looking at your infrastructure, looking at your devices, looking at the software that's being used, training them on that software, um, and then communication and collaboration. So your you things like Microsoft Teams, you know, mm. those sorts of things to enable the organization to function uh, correctly. So very much it's a, an efficiency uh, thing for me as opposed to, and again, I think there is this tendency to look at technology in schools and ed tech as these bolt-on luxury tools. And I was I was talking to an ed tech company the other day and they were saying one of their problems is, is that, that a school adopts their technology, they do it for a year, they really like it, and then the budget's problems hit and they go, what's the first thing we ditch? And mm -hmm. it's the technology. And I'm thinking, well, probably then you haven't made the right technology choice because if it's not fulfilling your core needs then it becomes a luxury and, and you shouldn't be in the business of putting technology into schools just purely out of luxury. It should fulfill your business needs. And I guess your role has coincided. So you say you've been a year in this role. It's kind of coincided with the big explosion of AI. Things like ChatGPT have really come into public use now. Where do you see that use in your trust in the schools? So, I, I mean, I, I, my my journey with, with AI and ChatGPT, AI has been around for years, mm. obviously, but with ChatGPT, came around as a classroom teacher. So I adopted it straight away as it came in, in my classroom practice. So I was using it and playing with it and testing it and actually talking to students about it pretty much early on. And I was seeing the benefits to me as a teacher. Um, and so we very quickly rolled that out across the school that mm -hmm. I was at. And so we trained all our teachers and we trained our TAs um, and we found really great benefits for you know, using it with special edu for special educational needs, adapting materials. And so really it's then, it, we, we've then rolled that rollout again, that rollout structure across the, the whole trust. Um, and so we've seen, you know, quite major impacts for teachers, both in terms of time saving, but also in, in terms of creating more engaging lesson content. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I, for, for me, AI as a teacher reinvigorated my practice. It gave me a new tool to do some of the things that I was already doing. You spoke about it obviously transforming classroom teaching. Obviously, workload is one of the biggest issues in the sector. What are some of the other areas you see AI helping to change in education? At, at the moment, and I think that there is this tendency to get carried away with AI, at the moment, it's a very early iteration of what, what will come later on. And I don't think it's at the transformative stage right yeah. now. I, I think we're at a stage where people are getting to grips with this and working out where it can be useful and crucially, actually, where it shouldn't be in, in the classroom or in the schools. And so we are we are early days testing that. The time savings definitely are there. But again, adapting materials, for uh, we've seen some really great use cases for uh, adapting materials for students who uh, have special educational needs. And it's not that you couldn't do that before AI, but they were more time consuming to do. And teachers, as we all know, are hugely pressured in terms of time. And yeah. even if they have the will that they want to, you know, adapt materials to to, to cope with every uh, need that there are in, in schools, they just haven't got the time. So it's about enabling those things that we all want to do, enabling them to be to be done a little bit better. So along the lines of obviously adapting materials, what other specific AI examples of like the way you're using it in the trust have you got to share? Yeah, the, I mean, the examples are so hugely varied. And again, this is where the tech, I think the technology is, pe people look to the technology and go, right, it's great for lesson planning. And I think that's like quite a blunt way of, uh, of using these tools is, again, when I was using it, I wasn't using it to produce full lesson plans. I was using it in very individual use cases. So again, part of the training that I do in schools is asking straight away first, rather than going up front and doing training on AI, I ask the, the, the senior team, I ask the teachers, what existing challenges have they got in school? And then we match those challenges to the technology and use the technology to help match the challenges. So the use cases are absolutely varied. So one of our infant schools wanted to adapt their curricular materials to more an inquiry-based approach. And they were doing that without AI previously. Mm -hmm. And I went in and showed them. And actually, only uh, very quick examples. And then the best training is they were actually using large language models 
ChatGPT and the like to to actually adapt their lesson materials and quotes. I mean, I, some some amazing quotes from teachers. One teacher said it's given her her weekends back. I've had another teacher actually in the session said this took me an hour and a half last week and it's taken her 10, 10 minutes this week. So. The use case is very, we've, we've had a primary school that have created uh, a literacy across the curriculum booklet. It's a promotional material, but using AI and created uh, monster characters for each of these subjects. Um, so many use cases that that we can describe. So, I, I mean, again, I, I when I talk to people about AI, I try and avoid going, this is what you can use AI for, yeah. because that's an AI first approach. I go, what are your problems? What are you trying to achieve? And then I say, this is how AI can help you do that. And in terms of the training, so you spoke about going into the schools, how would you get that time aside to go in and what does training look like? Mm -hmm. So again, the training, my training has evolved over time, but essentially the model now is I go in and do an, uh, what I call an AI jet wasp presentation. And it's, it's really a quick a, a blast of a, a, an hour. And it's mainly me, it's me speaking, yeah. uh, uh, me talking about the ethics, the issues, the, the risks, the concerns, and then showing lots of use case examples of how I've used it in the classroom. And then frequently, more frequently now, how I've seen others using it in the classroom. And so it's to give p people a, a general picture of, look, this is what the technology is. These are the benefits. These are the risks. But subsequently, I then go into, I, I go into the school and it could be two weeks later. It could be a month later, whenever the school will have capacity. I initially talked to the senior team and said, what, what are you trying to achieve? And I then go into the school and with teachers sat on devices, I then help them achieve that. Mm. in the school and so we could pr we could sit there for an hour and i i don't speak it's me supporting the teachers yeah. using ai to 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 do the things they're they're doing already and i think one of the most effective training off the cuff trainings i've done is i walked in and i said right what are the next three things that you were going to do once this training session finishes and we all know teachers were teachers they're very good when they sit in training, but they're always thinking when they lead the training, what's the jobs they've got to do before they can sit down yeah. at night? Um, and so, uh, you know, I used that opportunity to say, what's the next three things you were going to do when you go home to prepare for the next day? And I said, right, we're going to get that done now. Um, and so I then support those teachers. And the reason that's so powerful is it's so meaningful to them. Mm. They know that that's something they wanted to do anyway. They're going to save themselves time immediately because then they'll go home having done it. And crucially, they will have seen the benefits that, AI can help in, in that particular situation. And there's no teacher who's, who's ever been through that form of training goes, I don't want this in my life anymore. I'm, I want to be more, less efficient. I, yeah. want to, I want to go home and work at, uh, at ridiculous hours. So I guess that's the thing is showing that it's meaningful and that yeah. it works for them and their individual use cases to get them on side. Yeah, it's exactly that. And again, this is crucial for me is don't use technology unless it's meaningful. Yeah. It's, you should not use technology just for the sake of it. I guess one of the worries people have had around technology and then the use of AI is the digital divide. Do you feel like there is a digital divide and how might that look in a trust and then at school level? The short answer to that is yes, there is, is, is a digital divide. But I think people tend to focus on devices, access to devices and access to Wi-Fi. And that, that is an issue. But again, particularly with AI, what, I, what I'm seeing is, is actually people with digital skills that are the biggest divide. And, mm. and again, people stereotype it like the young people, they don't have di a digital divide. The older people, they're, they're the people who need to, to uh, or struggle to adopt technology. But it's across the board. And again, with, with AI, we've done surveys in our schools amongst our parents. And our, our most deprived parents are not using AI so much in their jobs, in their, in their roles. Yeah. And so they're not seeing that, they're not having that exposure. Whereas the parents who are perhaps in least, least deprived areas, they're starting to use it in their jobs and they're talking about it around the, around the dinner table with their, with, with their sons and daughters. And, and, and so there are lots of divides opening up, I think, around technology. I don't think there's an easy answer to that. If anybody said to me, how do we stop this? I don't think you can, but I, I think the major thing for me is, is, is education, is building awareness and education. And you, you, you can only chip away at this mm. sort of stuff uh, and be conscious of it. Do you think long term then AI has the potential to maybe divide initially, but as it's used more in people's jobs, in people's homes, it levels the playing field in some sense? Or yeah, I think, uh, and I think that's the great hope with AI is certainly it's it, it, it's a decentralizing and uh, a, a more democratic, I think, kind of technology mm. in that 
you potentially don't need the expertise and the knowledge to do certain things that you used to used to do. So there is potential there, but again, it's a tool, and I think it's how those tools are yeah. used. And I think I think the incentives in our society anyway are are sort of skewed. And I, I think what AI, what I have seen is AI really a, is an amplifier. It amplifies what exists already in society. And so I think there are there there's reason to be really hopeful, but you know, again, we should be cautious because um, there's also reason to be concerned. I guess one of the things that people are most cautious about is AI replacing jobs mm-hmm. down the line. Do you think AI is a threat to the teaching profession? So this is a highly emotive question, and I've thought about this a, a lot. And, you know, do I think it will replace teachers? I, I sort of think that's the wrong question, because when we say that, it depends on what we define as a teacher. And in our traditional definition of a teacher, there are certain aspects to that role that perhaps we wouldn't we wouldn't say is teaching. Mm. And people focus on the human side, the care of the students, the motivation of the students. And I don't think AI is ever going to, to replace that. So the human side, I actually think will be amplified and those human sides of teaching will be amplified. I think there are aspects of teaching where it's more vulnerable to machines and AI because of efficiency. And actually, I think we should embrace that. We've Im- Again, we go back to that overhead projector example. Mm. You know, we weren't fearful over PowerPoint replacing teachers there. There was a, you know, no teacher wants to be sitting there writing on, on, an, on an acetate. So I think we should embrace what the efficiencies that, that AI can bring. Um, but I, I, I do think, and actually as a teacher, I, this is why I was so keen to adopt it, is actually it can do some of the things that I was doing with it in in a much better and more efficient way. And so the answer to the question is I I, I don't know that we'll have the same training routes as teachers. I don't know that we'll necessarily in the future call them teachers. They might well be, we we might as humans in the classroom or even outside the classroom be doing very different things. So I think anybody that thinks that we're going to be sitting still in 10, 15, 20 years in four walls of a classroom with one to 30 ratios, I, th- I think that idea, it's a threat to that. But I would say, actually, we need to embrace that threat because there are we already know, again, with the teaching profession, it's strained. We are mm. resource poor. And, and actually, I think now's the time where actually we, we should embrace this to help that situation rather than push, it, push back on it. Now, see, that's looking at the impact on staff. There's also an impact on pupils. And one of the biggest concerns has been they might use AI to cheat on their homework. They might use AI to produce an essay. How can you implement this sort of technology without it also being, I guess, a risk to the way that you do things in the classroom and set homework outside of it? Yeah, well, controversially, I don't think we can. Uh, we, we have to take those risks. Um, and, and we should take those risks, I think. And now more than ever, we, in order to be innovative, which is what we need to be do, we need to take some risk. We need to manage those risks and do it responsibly. And, and students are using this, you know, anecdotally, or we've done surveys amongst a whole groups of schools, um, and students are using this. And they are using it sometimes responsibly, but more often not responsibly at the moment because they haven't, they're, they're new to it as much as we are. Th- there is a risk for students to outsource, and, and for adults actually, mm-hmm. to outsource their thinking to, to an AI. Uh, and that's where the only way you can, you can guard against that is by really understanding this, this technology and using it to work out when it can be good and when it can't mm-hmm. be. There's no one's got these answers at the moment. And so we do need to encourage use, but that's safe and responsible use. And we need to be talking about it. This is actually, it's not just AI in education. This is AI in society. And we're all trying to work out. Not, it's not just students, it's not just teachers. We're trying to work out whether this technology is good for us, whether it's not good for us, where it can be useful and where it can't be useful. So our, our focus has actually been much less on students. It's been on teachers understanding because, again, I think there are some schools that have gone quite strong on bringing chatbots into the classroom for the students to use. And, and I'm I'm a little bit wary of that approach. I think, you know, we've got to work this out. And again, when I was in the classroom using AI, I, at the same time as me using it for myself to help me prepare uh, c- certain activities, I was then talking to the students about it. And in those conversations is real power. Um, it, 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 one, one of the students put their hand up and said, sir, do, we, do you think this is going to make people lazy? And we then 
went on a 10, 15 minute conversation about our thoughts around mm. that. And I think that's that's true education. It's yeah. we, we've, we've got a new piece of technology that's affecting the whole of society and we need to talk about it and we need to prod and poke at this to work out what the risks are. So is it going to be risk free? No, but I think we can manage those risks. And in your trust, would you feel comfortable for students to say, yes, I did use this, I used ChatGPT to help me with my homework or where is the place you want to get at? Are we encouraging use of that at home or is it something that I know how to use this, but I didn't use it with that? Is is there transparency and honesty encouraged there? Uh, it's certainly encouraged, but again, we're going through a phase of working out what's going on. Um, so I think we'll get to a point where we will work out. And again, this is to do with our exams and assessment system yeah. as well. So we're, we're sort of led by that. And so, well, I mean, again, anecdotally, we know that there are there are exam boards using um, AI detectors yeah. to detect AI work in, in particularly coursework, actually, mm -hmm. which has its own concerns around, you know, most of our disadvantaged students are doing those coursework. So they're the ones being impacted by yeah. this. And so we're working out those, and there's certain needs to be the transparency in that in the existing exam system. But I think we're going to start to move to a different form. We're going to have to move to a different system where we embrace AI as an assistant to some of the some of the things we're doing. And and students, you know, again, when we're talking to students, they're quite aware, they're becoming increasingly aware of this. They know it's going to be an important skill to use AI in their future workplace. What we can't do is ban this, but we do need to start working out some guidelines around one, our existing system and how we use AI in that system, but also how we adapt a system to, mm. to cope with a, a, a post-AI era. So you don't think that is the right approach to ban ChatGPT on school systems? <laughs> I certainly, I, I don't think you can do it, but um, if, if there are schools out there doing it, uh, good luck to them because I don't think they're immune to the impacts of it because their teachers will be using it, even if yeah. banned in school, and their students will be using it. But what they're then doing is basically saying, we're ignoring the fact mm -hmm. that they're doing it. And yeah, I, I just, I, I don't think that approach, uh, hopefully, I mean, I don't hear many people now, there are some who are banning it, but yeah, I, I think you can't hold back that tide yeah. for, for much longer. And could you give some specific examples of how technology has enhanced classroom teaching in your trust in schools? Yeah, technology in general, I, I guess. Um, I, I guess the main one, which sort of uh, moved us onto a more of a, a journey as a trust, is our adoption of Microsoft Teams. And again, there are other platforms out there, but we happened to adopt Microsoft Teams. But we did it, crucially, I think, about a year and a half before the pandemic. Whereas I think most schools adopted mm, Teams as a, 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 during the pandemic to solve the, the problem of teaching at home. But the difficulty with that is they jumped in at a use case of that technology, which was one particular use case, uh, which was the teaching side of it. And what we did before that is put a lot of work in because it's actually a communication and collaboration platform. And so we used it to pretty much replace email in our school. So we we sort of said for internal use, we weren't using email because we all know email is an, an absolute time, nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> so we implemented Teams as a communication and collaboration platform. And when the pandemic came around, actually it was a it was a natural add-on then to add the the teaching and learning side of it and mm. the class teams on top of it. And that platform is utterly embedded in the school that I came from last year. Um, and increasing now, we're moving that across the trust. And the, the efficiency of communication, the ability to collaborate is... And again, this is an example of where it's not a luxury. This is enabling you to do what you need to do uh, in your organization, but better, quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's a, I, I think that's a real success story, but it's, it's one where I, I, I was asked at one point, can we measure the impact of that? I, I know everybody wants to measure the impact of everything yeah. at the moment, but I view it like with technology is, it, for me, it's like electricity. You don't measure the impact of electricity in your organization. It's something that makes it function. And that's, that's the view of technology I think we all need to shift to. And it's one of the, one of the biggest struggles actually in, this, in the role that I've got is people shifting people from viewing technology as a bolt-on to yeah. viewing it as the electricity that supports everything else in your school. And how do you change that mindset? Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly one at a time. And I, I guess, again, heavily em emphasizing when anybody says anything around technology, it's not, for me, it's not a tools first approach. It's a problem first mm -hmm. approach and then matching the right tool to solve that problem. Um, so I think, I, and I, I really go heavy on that when I do training and when I talk to anyone and I pick people up when they're going, I've seen this really good platform, this good bit of kit. 
can we put it into a school? Like, well, why are you putting it in? What, what, are you, what is the problem that you're trying to solve by putting that in? And is that the best way of doing yeah. it? Is there another technological solution? Or actually, is there a non-technological solution that would serve that problem better? And when you're in a trust of 26 schools, it's hard to keep an eye on everything. But how would you make sure that there is collaboration and consistency across all of those schools? Yeah, so I mean, again, I've only been in the role for a year, so I'm quite quite new to this. But my approach really has been with the 26 schools. I'm very much on the go with the energy that's there. Um, and th- there are across those all of those 26 schools, we've got schools that are utterly embracing technology and have got the capacity to drive it themselves, down to schools that struggle with that capacity because they haven't got necessarily the right people in place, or they may be slightly more resistant. So year one really is about uh, growing that motivation and showing people the real benefits of it. So it, actually introducing, heightening the emotion around it, the positive emotion, embracing the benefits. So what I've done really is focus on schools that can do that and are in a position to do it and want to do it, and then showcase those to perhaps those other schools to show them actually, look, here's something that you could benefit from. And here's we've actually got a use case in here that can support you in doing it in addition. Um, I also, I mean, I, I'm regularly communicating, again, through teams across the whole trust, but I set, I also send out an email across the whole trust with updates, technological updates. And again, very manageable. One thing to do, one thing to see, one thing to try across the whole trust. And all the staff get get those things. Yeah. Um, and so I'm communicating, you know, keeping a drip feed of, look, actually, these are the benefits of of technology. And this is how you could use it if you want to come to this. We also have a, I've established a group of digital leaders across all of our schools. So we've got one digital leader in, in all the schools. Um, and again, we, we collaborate. And again, year two of our strategy really will be to formalize those structures a little bit more. So year one is about bringing the energy forward. And year two is right, right, we've now established that actually there's, there's, there's a lot of will to adopt this technology and a lot of benefits to it. So we now need to put some more structures in place around it to support those schools in, in doing it themselves because one person can't do that across 26 schools. And when it comes to appointing those digital leaders, are those people that you saw took more of an interest or how did you make sure that they were the right people for the job? Yeah, initially it is interest. You know, and again, you, you, everybody knows what it's like working in schools is you're not just doing one job, you're doing hundreds of jobs. So what you need is people interested because if you you don't have someone interested, it's not going to work. So interest is your, your absolute key. But again, it, it's it's then shaping that as, as you go forward. So you've got people that are interested. You now then need to provide the structures around them because again, you might have someone who perhaps hasn't got the clout in the school to make decisions. And so you need to make sure that that person, they've got the interest, but you need to have them supported by leadership yeah. in order to make that role function effectively. So again, it's it's about putting those structures around those people uh, to enable that interest to be more infectious and more impactful. And when you're trying to get people involved in something, there's obviously multiple layers to getting people on side, to making sure they understand. What are some of the biggest challenges that you face when trying to get people on side? Mm -hmm. If if I'm honest, I don't don't get a lot of pushback um, because I think if done in the right way and again, done purposefully, people, people, it's hard for them not to see the benefits of technology. But I think... It's, it's tr- changing those traditional mindsets is the biggest barrier, is that we're not doing this just because it's fun, which it can be. We're not doing it just because we want to introduce technology. We're doing it always with a purpose. And I, I think there is a traditional mentality that this is toys that you're mm. introducing into school as opposed to efficiency tools. Uh, and that's the biggest, I, I think, the biggest barrier is, is making that mindset shift in, in people that, this is something that's actually really important. This is, it's, it's a modern world. It's, it's giving people the tools of a modern workplace. And if trust leaders are listening to this now and are thinking about the fact that when budgets get tight, that could be something that they would cut technology devices. What would you say to them when that budgetary considerations are happening and technologies on the table is one of the things that might be cut up? Well, I, I guess what I'd say is one of the, one of the, the biggest uh, costs of a school is your staffing budget. Um, and, we know staff are pushed for time. And if technology can save you time, that means it does save you, it saves you a, a, a lot of money. So I, I, my personal opinion is, is, again, it's my viewpoint is technology actually is going to save you time. And if it doesn't, 
you shouldn't be using technology. Budget pressures are huge in school. Um, and, the, the, you know, I haven't been a head teacher. I've been a deputy head in a school. I know how, how, how that budgets are, are, are really scrutinized in a school. But technology is not... It, it, if, if you can save money by getting rid of a product, perhaps that product wasn't the right one in the first place. Yeah, that makes sense. And looking ahead... Obviously, things change so quickly in technology, especially with AI. But what are some of your goals and ambitions when it comes to the use of technology and specifically AI in your trust? Mm -hmm. I sort of view AI. Uh, AI is like a bit like an invisible staircase to me. Is no one knows where this is going. Um, and so really, I, I guess my sort of mission with, with training and, and, and implementing technology uh, on AI in schools is... I think it will be a very dangerous position once these new steps open up and they're opening up very, very quickly is if we're at the bottom of the staircase when this technology really takes off, it's going to be too big a jump for some people. So really my, my mission is to support all our staff in reaching the topmost stair they can at this time so that they can very easily when these new steps appear walk up that staircase. Um, and I, I, I think that's really, really important. I think for, for people to feel confident in their own digital skills and their AI skills, and it's and very much the approach we've taken is using large language models. Mm -hmm. There are other tools out there that ed tech companies are developing. I, you know, we call them wrapper apps or whatever with chat GPT or similar in the background and a pretty skin over the top. I actually don't think that is teachers using AI is teachers pressing buttons and then the AI doing the work in the background. So we very much focused on using large language models because only in your use of these tools can you learn about their risks, their limitations, and can you learn that helps you move up those next steps. And what do you think are some of the biggest risks? We've seen cyber attacks get more and more intelligent and targeting large trusts. How can those risks be mitigated? Mm -hmm. So again, these are these come down to your your, your syst safeguarding systems in school and your digital and your cybersecurity in school. Those sorts of things they don't change with AI. They're, they're they're things that need to be in place. They're part of your core offer, really. Um, and with students, you know, people say, how can we safeguard students? There are very well established safeguarding uh, routes and and structures in place. And actually, AI needs to be brought within those as opposed to doing something something different. Um, so. Yeah, those those concerns are massive um, with, with AI. Um, and it, it's not just schools that are facing that. It's all industries are, are facing those. Um, and so I, I would uh, essentially what you do have to do is fall back on your, your, your existing structures and systems and adapt uh, those to cope with what's coming in the future. And do you ever see a time when AI would be in the curriculum? It's interesting, actually. Yes. I, I, I mean, I, I think possibly use of AI tools in the curriculum. Um, but uh, again, I think what we're seeing with AI is at the moment, it's, it's almost outside of everything we're doing. And more and more, we're going to start to see AI in integrated with everything we're yeah. doing. So I don't know if we'll see AI discreetly in the curriculum. I think that's, the, again, the natural tendency is that's what we'll start to do. But I don't think that's probably the right approach. And again, I think what we need to do is make sure AI is integrated into everything we do mm. because it, it's starting to be integrated into every aspect of our lives anyway. And people listening might be surprised um, to learn as well as doing all your stuff in education, you're also trained as a life coach. Um, how did that come about and how has that impacted the way that you lead in your trust? So uh, through doing the life coaching course, which is part of a hypnotherapy course, it was it was all about people. It was about motivation of people. And actually, one of the things I learned with a hypnotherapy course is pretty much no one could be hypnotized unless they want to be. And, and so that belief and motivation is absolutely crucial. And I guess the same with life coaching is you're working out what people want to do and what their beliefs and shifting their beliefs. And I guess it's the same same in my role as digital education or as a teacher it's about motivation. It's about f working out what people want to do and how how to get them to achieve those things. And how do you think people, like, if you're looking at motivation, what do you think is the single biggest thing that motivates people, especially in education? Their beliefs. It, it is their beliefs, what they believe about things. If, if, if people walk into my classroom and don't believe it's going to be a good experience in that classroom or don't believe they're going to learn, 
it's very hard to shift them. It's hard to motivate them. So again, as a teacher, one of the things I tried to create right from the off was a friendly, welcoming, positive environment to give those kids a chance to, to go, actually, I could achieve here. And they, once they believe they can, they're more likely to be able to do it. And exactly the same with technology. It's, it's going, do, do you actually believe that this technology can be useful? And if people don't believe that, it's much harder to shift them. Mm. And as well as doing training as the life coach, obviously all your work in education, you've also somehow managed to fit in a trek to the base camp of Mount Everest. Can you tell us a bit about that and why you did it and what you learned from that? Yeah, so I mean, it was it was basically a three week trip, um, and we 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 trekked for roughly I think about five hours in the morning each day. Um, I mean, uh, one of my abiding memories, I guess, is waking up in the morning because often when we finished a trek, we did so there was quite a lot of cloud cover. So you couldn't see what was around you. And we went to bed, not really knowing the environment we were in. Um, and then when we woke up and generally the mornings were much sunnier and we woke up and we used to see the mountains all around us and it just, it took, took your breath away. Um, so th those sort of experiences really just, uh, again, it just gives you space to breathe. And I, 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 I meditate as part of my life as well. And, and it's, I think I spent a lot of the trek in the moment, just looking at things that I'd never seen before, uh, talking to people that I'd never talked to before. Um, and, you know, the, the chat, you know, I, I'm, I'm relatively fit, but, you know, it was certainly a challenge. And so for people listening, just how high up is base camp? So I think it's just over 5,000 meters, um, which at that level, you definitely are starting to, uh, or potentially will start to feel uh, altitude sickness. And certainly as we're going, I was I was very lucky actually. I, you know, you drink a lot of water, you, you need to drink a lot of water to, to ward off that. But I was very lucky that I didn't experience any altitude sickness, but certainly people in the party, uh, one of them had to had to turn back uh, as a result of that. So, How many of you were doing it together? In the party, we started off the, the group that I was with, there were six of us, uh, ended up as four of us we finished as a group of four. But as we finished, actually, we went to base camp, but there's um, there's a, 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 a mountain just across from base camp after we got there. The next morning you travel up there and you walk up there and it's not, it's not a huge climb, but you know, you, you're in minus 25 temperatures and you're walking up early morning. So I think it was about four in the morning. So you could see the sunrise over Everest. And you know, that was it was pretty arduous, that was. so that. I mean, that is incredible. That's two of my worst fears is waking up really early and being really cold, <laughs> let alone doing the climb as well. I'm not sure I could do those two things. Wow, that is incredible. And then I guess it takes as long to get back down. So how long is it? A week and a half up, week and a half down? No, or? it's actually much quicker to... to you can travel a, a, a lot speedier as, yeah. as you go down. You're, not, you're taking it a little bit easier as you're going up because you're always acclimatizing to the yeah. additional altitude. So going back down, you don't don't have that problem. So I think it... I, I want to say it was about three, three and a half days uh, to get back down. Uh, and what was what was lovely is to have the first beer back back yeah. down when you got low, low enough altitude. Yeah, I was going to say more than one beer probably deserved <laughs> after all <laughs> that walking. But yeah, it's incredible. And I just want to touch on the point you said about meditating. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness is one of those things that when people are into it and they can do it, it's transformative to their lives. How did you get into that? And how do you sustain that in a busy life? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, I, I've always just been interested in what makes people tick and what why I'm like I am. So I guess I've always had this side to me that just wants to just work out who I am, really. Um, so that's how I got into it. But I mean, I, I, I try to practice regularly, but there are times like everybody has in a busy life where 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 it goes out the window. But I, it's building a building a bit of routine and not not trying to do too much. Um, but but certainly, you know, when people first start meditating they think they're not very good at it because they start to observe all the thoughts that are in their heads. That's so, me. I've tried yeah. it many times and every time I'm like, I can't stop thinking. But that's, <laughs> that's actually the first sign of success because you're becoming aware of those thoughts. Whereas pr previously, if you weren't meditating, you wouldn't be aware of them. So actually the first thing is you're starting to become more aware because you're actually seeing the amount of thoughts you've got in your head. And what would your advice be for school leaders to achieve that elusive work-life balance? I've always been lucky that I've I've viewed my job as a job and my I guess the things that are important to me in my home life uh, and I've always done my job and I put everything into it but in order to I know the priority is the home life so I guess my advice in a way is make sure you remember what's most important to you So 
So we like to um, finish the podcast with a quick fire session. Four questions, four quick answers. Um, So number one, what do you think is the single biggest challenge facing the education sector at this moment? I think uh, probably it's well known is the recruitment. Um, We we are seeing a a real recruitment uh, problem in schools. Um, The quality of staff, uh, the quantity of staff uh, and and the de- ever increasing demands and those two things coming together is is a major concern. How would you see technology or AI helping with recruitment and retention? Well, I, I think it, it it is part it's got to be part of the solution. Um, uh, you know, obviously other things will be done to try and solve those things, but if you've got less people um, in, in a school or perhaps those people are, are needing to be trained and it takes time to train them. There are things that AI can do to support that that process and certainly things that technology can do to support that process. And what is it that motivates you on your difficult days? I guess it's people. Uh, that's that's what it always comes back to, to with me is, uh, you know, I, I loved it in the classroom when I saw a, a child uh, unlock something they were trying to do and the pleasure that they got from that. And again, the same with training training staff as well is those moments really motivate me. And what do you think has been your proudest achievement in your career so far? Oh, wow. Little moments down a corridor where, I don't know, you've, I've shaken a kid's hand or whatever. And, and the, the connections that you make, for me, are the biggest mm. achievements. The, I, I think I struggle to answer the question because the, the, I'm not an ambitious type of person. And so the typical things that you'd go to with these sort of things they're just part of life for me. So I, I think the biggest achievements are just those individual interactions where you've known you've made a little bit of difference. And in your mind, that might be little, but that's someone's life that you could have changed. So they are huge achievements. But um, what are you most looking forward to in the next academic year? Um, I think I'm most looking forward to, I, I, again, I, I've always loved being in the classroom I, and I'm not in the classroom anymore, but what I do love is going into a school and training staff. And, and you know, those, those moments where I'm sat in front of a group of staff and I'm showing them doing things, a, a friend of a friend who was really, she's a teacher, she was really struggling uh, with, with what she was doing. She hadn't heard of AI and she was sat, sat in my, my living room and she was talking to my wife who was, and she was saying, oh, I've got this this thing to do. And uh, I said, bring your laptop round and we'll sit and do use, use AI to support you doing that. And we, we sat for three hours and at the end of it, you could see the load lift off her and she was like, wow, this is going to so help me. And so that's what I'm most looking forward to is, is seeing what I know is a really intense profession and a really difficult profession is seeing the ability that AI has to shift some of that burden. It's not going to ever solve it, but it can shift it. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Chris. It was so good to chat to you. And I feel like the trust leaders listening will have a lot to take away. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And thank you very much to Chris for joining us today. To find out more about how The Key can support your trust, please visit thekeysupport.com forward slash trust. For more information about Chris, links to relevant resources and information on how to subscribe to the Trust Matters monthly newsletter, head to the description below. If you enjoyed this episode, please do like and subscribe or leave us a review.